So I'm going to use the same format uh, we used in the first 20 minutes. I'm going to call in this case just one question before I open it up more widely. And that question was uh, submitted by David Fitzsimons from Odeen Hollands. And David, I think, is there. Yes, no, just there. If we can just... Peter, can the phone. Over to you, David. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Julia, I wonder whether you could help us by saying how useful the court on commitment was to you when you had to take the risk internally of trying to convince senior managers at Asda and perhaps Walmart to try a very innovative project, which was the Easy Serve project, which you discussed. Did you use the Courtauld commitment to try and get your senior colleagues to come on board with that? It's a really good question. I think if I go back through um, how we've evolved with RAP and with, from the first Courtauld commitment to where we are today, certainly when we were looking right back at the beginning of Courtauld, we recognised that we needed collaboration to help achieve some of the aims that, that we wanted to achieve. And the Courtauld commitment was a way of saying to the business, if we sign up to this, then it will help plug us in to other like-minded businesses and we can work together to achieve our aims. I think it's been very successful in getting into the psyche around the business, particularly our board directors. So when we look ahead to things like the Easy Serve uh, in-store dispensing project, I didn't use Courtauld specifically in order to get the business to approve that project, but we did use the thinking behind it. So it's about collaboration. It's about um, taking a bit of a risk in an area that we don't understand and just pushing it and seeing how far we get and how much progress we can make. So I think actually the answer is wider than your question. Courtauld now is a way of thinking within our business. Courtauld being the shorthand for collaboration, for taking some risks, for making some progress. Good. Okay, now I'm opening up the floor for questions. Gentleman here, about halfway back in the front row. Uh, Simon Vladimir from the Mineral Products Association. Uh, just a quick comment on your, on your um, construction recycling uh, limit or, or value of 90%. That's about uh, what the nation is doing as a whole on construction waste, you'd be glad to know. So you're up with the average. And the other 10%, uh, the other 10% the other uh, you'd be glad to know is actually also positively used because restoring land is also positive and it goes to restoring the land that, uh, back to some sort of positive amenity afterwards. So there's a, there's a plus to the landfill side, so don't forget that. Uh, but the, my real comment is on the, on the value you put on uh, climate change labelling, carbon footprinting, if you like. I was just cogitating on this this morning, funny enough, over my cornflakes, when I noticed that the uh, pint bottle of semi-skimmed milk had a carbon footprint of 800 grams. And I thought to myself, that seems extraordinarily high. Uh, and when I did a quick calculation, uh, and, and assume that an average household has two pints a day, which may be a bit less than some, but more than, my, or more than the, our small household does, it's equivalent uh, to the total uh, carbon footprint of a house in construction materials. Uh, um, it, with that, that sort of total construction materials for a house is equivalent to just under a year <coughs> supply of milk. So I'm just wondering how meaningful the 800 grams is. Uh, when you actually sort of start thinking of it in those terms. Okay, Julian. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think an interesting mm. comment about construction waste. And I think if we were to stop here today, we'd be at 90%. Great. But we're not stopping here today. We have a target of 100% diverted by January. Our numbers clearly have some lag in them because we want to make sure they are accurate. And that will put us, I believe, two years ahead of wrapped sectoral target. So I wouldn't underestimate the progress that a business like ours can make and then demonstrate to others how achievable it is. We're not talking about stopping here today. We're talking about where we are and then where we seek to be in the future. And I completely agree with your point about carbon labels. I think it's very difficult for... If you take someone like yourself who clearly knows their way around this space, if you are a standard customer who... Um, hasn't got a climate degree but reads the Daily Mail or whatever newspaper it might be, you're aware of the issues, but you're not aware of whether 800 grams of carbon is good or bad. So our, uh, we absolutely agree with you on that, that actually what we want to say to our customers is, we know that you recognise these are important issues and we are doing something about that. 
So if you were to go onto our website, you would see the fact that five years ago, we started working with our dairy suppliers to footprint all of the carbon emissions within liquid milk and actually a couple of other fresh food supply chains as well. And then we created an on-farm calculator that we said, so the best farmer is at this level. Here's a free calculator to all the rest of our dairy farmers to get you to that level. But you wouldn't find that on a product. Mm. Next question, please. Question here at the front. Thank you very much. Um, is this on? Yeah, Kay Twitch in Essex County Council and a huge ASDA fan. <laughs> and, and if I may say so, an absolutely brilliant speech, but I'm left slightly confused. My perception as a, as a housewife shopper type person of ASDA is good value. High quality, but essentially good value. That's your label. If I was thinking of the greenest food retailer, I would probably go for Marks and Spencers. Now, you are clearly doing a huge amount to achieve sustainability um, in your product lines. But somehow you're not capitalizing on that in terms of the brand identity. You must be doing that on purpose because you're too smart a cookie to be letting it happen to you by accident. So what's the thinking behind that? And can you see it changing as more and more people become more green aware and want to do the right thing for the right reason? It's a really interesting area. and It's one that we challenge ourselves with all the time. So if I go out and do customer listening panels in stores, one of the things I'm trying to understand is what is the appetite for our customers for uh, green issues being communicated directly to them in store versus good value, versus quality, versus some of the other uh, metrics that we, that we use as a retailer. It's absolutely right that value and low price is primary to what we do. We are a value retailer. That's why people shop with us. That's why we have um, so many shoppers, 18 million currently, every single week. I think you will see us starting to communicate more in store about sustainability. Not on pack, but I think there is work we can do to just get some of our more holistic messages out there to just demonstrate to our customers we are doing more and more within this space. Um, I don't want to give too much away sitting here, because uh, I know the room's full of our competitors, but you, you will see activity next year that is starting to build on that, and that is putting customers right at the heart of what we do on sustainability. And in fact, I'll probably give too much away, but what I want to do is to start to ask our customers what policies we should have, and then change our policies based on their feedback, so that we truly take that transparency and apply it to the next level within sustainability. And in terms of if you're a customer that particularly wants this kind of information, I do see smart tools being available. So take something like the Sustainable Products Index that gives a rank for a product. Actually, why not be able to take your iPhone or your smartphone, take a picture of the barcode, and then get the information on your phone? If you're the customer that wants that information, we should make that available. So that's in our thinking, but I think putting it on the front of the pack is, is not really where we want to be currently. Well, you heard it first here. Um, now, can I just say this question is both for Julian and for Liz in this session, and I'll take the next question over the back there. I believe there's one over the corner there, please. Thank you very much. Sorry, this is again for Julian. Sorry, Liz. <laughs> can you um, just say who yeah, you are, where you're from? My name's uh, Mark Bannister. I'm Group Environment Manager for New Look Retailers. Uh, quick question for you about your supply chain, and I'm quite keen to understand what your key internal business case was for engaging with your suppliers around sustainability, in particular waste, water, and energy? Yeah, again, some, some really good questions today. I think we've got to be very clear that um, I would be wasting a lot of time if I tried to engage every single one of our suppliers. You know, we have, on average, 40,000 products in our stores. We don't have 40,000 suppliers. We certainly have tens of thousands of suppliers based around the world. So what we did was we said, we're going to tackle our supply chain mostly from a Walmart perspective. We gave a very clear steer to our Chinese suppliers back in October 2008. And we focus on China because if Walmart were a country, it would be the eighth biggest trader with China. So we take a lot of product out of that part of the world. And we said to them that times are changing. We want two things to happen going forward. We will, and we don't often use this word actually with our suppliers, we will demand that they demonstrate compliance with local environmental regulation. So we stipulated 
on the contracts in all the legal terms that that is a term and condition of doing business with us. Sounds kind of obvious, but actually the ripples through the supply chain from doing that have been very, very interesting. And then we said, and we will provide you with resource to help you come with us on the journey to become sustainable. And clearly some suppliers won't want to come on that journey because they don't believe it's the right thing to do or they've got a different business model. But actually we found the vast majority of suppliers do want to come with us. So we actually reshaped our auditing team, our ethical standards team, and said it's not right any longer for them to go out and just audit against ethics. So uh, child welfare, um, uh, paying conditions, unions, that kind of stuff. We obviously maintained that, but we said we're going to change the focus of that team to be a team that can go in and help support suppliers on ethics and on sustainability. And the auditing function actually can be done by third parties. So that still has to continue and absolutely does continue in an expanded form. So you have the ethical questionnaire, you now have a sustainability questionnaire added on top of that, but the Walmart team is available to go in and help you as a supplier. We've also worked on the ground in China with individual NGOs, and we've hooked up NGOs with those suppliers to, put them, uh, to give them access to the information that they need. And we've also helped to hook them up with the finance that they need as well to, to progress down this journey. And then in the UK, we've just done a trial with 30 suppliers where we, we went into their businesses and said, looking at wastewater and energy, exactly as you said, um, how much savings can we make? And we identified at least £3 million worth of savings if we were to go in there today and do that. And we're shaping that up to be um, a project for next year now to take it out of the trial phase and actually deliver that across some of our categories. And then the third area, if you take the sustainability index, it's going to take us some years to get to that holy ground of the one score at the end. So we've created what I tend to, in my mind, call the intermediate index, which is a list of 15 questions that asks our suppliers things like, do you know how much energy you use? Do you know what your carbon emissions are? Do you have a plan in place to reduce those? You know, how are you progressing on these kind of areas and this kind of information? And we've actually plugged that questionnaire into what's called Retail Link, Retail Link is our IT system that all of our suppliers get access to, and it tells them what their sales rates are, what their margins are, etc. So we put it at the heart of that fundamental information they need to do business with us. And we're requiring more and more that we would like them to complete that. Um, and actually, the uptake so far has been, been pretty good. So lots of different ways of tackling it. I think we have to do the global slightly different to the local, um, but actually the path is the same at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Question at the front here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, Lauren Singer from Home Retail Group, the parent company of Argos and Homebase. This is a question uh, for Liz. Um, just a comment about um, Julian's excellent presentation and uh, the fact that he mentioned uh, RAP's um, funding and the importance of helping to fund innovative products. And um, we're very grateful for the um, for the funding that was uh, received for our innovative reusable sofa bag, uh, which is saving us at least 1,800 tons of packaging uh, a year. And that's, uh, I think it's a really good example of you know, how we can work together. Um, my question to, to Liz is about the uh, spending review uh, and uh, the extent to which uh, this type of funding uh, and, and this type of resource is still going to be available, especially for um, the Home Improvement Sector Initiative, which, as you know, is hoping to save at least 15% of packaging over the next couple of years, and also to help us uh, with improvements in toy packaging, which I know is close to uh, the Secretary of State's heart. Uh, and I'm sorry that she wasn't here to, uh, to hear the question. <laughs> well, I, th I think the funding does play an important part, but I think it's only one small part of the whole picture in actually making, making coming up with solutions. So, you know, it is, it's about having lots of partners as well. So. Our, our, really our core expertise, our core skills and the unique things about RAP are our expertise and our ability to bring people together. So if we bring the right people together, we, we've got to find smarter ways and cheaper ways of making sure some of those innovative projects happen. Because I completely understand you need to have some innovative projects to actually make those step changes. So um, understand the point, um, money is going to be tight, so we'll have to find some more creative ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. Next question, please. Yep. A hand went up quickly over here. Richard, 
I'll ask the gentlemen at the back if they wouldn't mind just trying to turn the heating down. We'll try and do that over coffee, but thank you very much for that suggestion. Yeah, I understand that. Sir, over to you. Thank, thank you. Um, Adrian Hawkes from Valpac. Um, in the light of um, what we've been hearing about the demands for increased resource use and recycling and, and so on, I just wondered what both Julian's and Liz's view was of the government's announcement recently of no substantial change to packaging recycling targets for at least the next two years. Just your thoughts. Hmm. Let me say that first. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Could that, okay. I think the question was around recycling targets and the commentary on what the panel's view is on the fact that recycling targets are not particularly going to change over the next two years, if I've understood that correctly. Packaging targets, thank you very much. I'm packaging recycling targets. I, I, I might just answer that in quite a, quite a narrow way for us, because I think this is the, the key way it impacts us. If we were to achieve target one of quartile two, which is to, to make a reduction in the carbon intensity of our packaging, I think we're going to need more recyclers within that packaging itself. And I think there needs to be a way of stimulating the market, stimulating the industry, of creating, of capturing and then creating more recyclers. Mm -hmm. Ideally from within the UK or within Europe, not from, from China. Um, my concern is that those kind of signals from the government don't help to stimulate that kind of shake-up that the industry needs to get some of these new materials back for us to use within our packaging. Well, I mean, the government went out and consulted and they took, no they took into account all the responses and it really it's a matter of the government what they decided to do in the end. But, I mean, our perspective in, and the approach we're taking with Courthold is to move beyond weight-based and recycling-type target approaches. It's about looking at the overall environmental impact and trying to reduce the env environmental impact through a whole range of things using recycled content, different materials, whatever. And, and also even extending it up the supply chain as well. So it's, I think it's a much broader issue and, and you know, packaging recycling figures feels to me like a very narrow, narrow perspective on it. Okay. Next question please. Yes, question here at the back. The, the, very, the one the first hand up, thank you very much. Yeah. I've just been getting instructions on how to hold a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Angus McPherson, the Environment Exchange. Thank you both Liz and Julian for your presentations today. Um, I was interested, and I'm sorry Liz, it's avoiding you on this occasion, um, uh, on Julian's uh, thoughts on three statements that you made. One, that you felt that a facilitator was not suitable if it was a trade association. I wondered why. The second point is I wondered how useful you had found it internally when environmental subjects, and you touched on the social subjects as well, were crystallized into a financial value, whether it be the packaging recovery note that um, Adrian touched on or whether it be the carbon emissions note. And the third one was I wondered how you thought um, ASDA might embrace the Secretary of State's enthusiasm for deposit schemes. Three questions. Okay, I'll try and remember all, all three. I'll definitely not forget deposits. So um, yeah, I think the, the difficulty with a trade association being the convening party in responsibility deals comes back to our lawyers and the competition law elements. Very, very simply, um, if the trade association is there to represent that sector of industry, which generally it is. Um, can we demonstrate, if needs be, that um, they haven't got involved in putting the deal together? Because actually they will have got involved in putting the deal together. Therefore, do they form part of a cartel? And we'd have to go through an investigation to ensure that no one's been put at a disadvantage because of that cartel. It just makes it far simpler, I think, to use a third party unrelated to industry to have those kind of discussions. Um, the second question was around... Um, was it around how much finance plays a part in mm, achieving? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. I think if you went back to when we started on sustainability in 2005, finance was extremely important because it was a way of talking in common language to the executives within the business, something that they understood. So we could say we need to hit these carbon reduction targets and it will cost you X amount or it will save you X amount. They can understand the pounds and pence figures. So it's quite a useful um, terminology to have in those days. I don't think we're quite finished with it yet either. 
Uh, in fact, it's all been brought back up through carbon reduction commitment now being in effect a levy uh, rather than a, a cap and trade scheme uh, that we were expecting. And I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think we do need to keep focus on um, price, on economy, and on um, economic sustainability then, as an extension of that. Particularly for ourselves, if we're a low-cost retailer, our sustainability plan should slot in with being a low-cost retailer. What I would say is I haven't seen it as a barrier um, to this date. PRNs in particular, um, if we look at PRN um, cost is likely to go down um, over the next session. Um, I'm not sure what behaviours that's going to drive. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's not going to provide the income that the industry needs to answer some of the questions we've already had earlier today. Um, so we'll have to, have to wait and see on that one. Um, the third question was... Deposit. Was returns? Deposits. I thought I wouldn't forget it. Yeah, it did, yeah. Um, we looked at this in, in quite a lot of detail, as, as you can imagine. Uh, and we looked at parts of the states where Walmart operates a deposit scheme. And there are a number of, of individual states who do that. But then we also overlaid on top of that what stops our customers from recycling currently. And it all goes back to the ease of being able to recycle. So actually, if we forget almost for a minute the economics of recycling, our customers tell us that they want curbside to be the primary means of returning packaging for it to be reused or recycled or energy recovered. And we know that because we've tried various ways of engaging them. So um, if the Secretary of State was still here, I'd actually challenge her around we haven't asked customers about packaging. We have a packaging section on our website that regularly gets questions in from our customers. And as part of that, we put specific packaging uh, bins in the front of our stores a couple of years ago and said, bring the packaging back and we'll do good things with it for you, we'll recycle it, etc., etc. Hardly used at all. And all of our research points to curbside being the way to generate the capture rates that we need to get these materials back. We don't believe that deposits will actually help. A very small amount attached to a glass bottle, I don't believe will be the incentive needed to move where we want to be, which is to get capture rates significantly increased. Thank you very much. I think at this stage, now we're spot on time, in fact, for going to coffee. I know there's been lots of questions in that session. We do have another slot for questions now. But well, can I ask those who've got questions? Uh, we now have half an hour at a coffee break, um, which is out of the back. It's already where we had lunch earlier. And maybe you can ask your questions there, or indeed hold them over for this afternoon's session. Finally, it just remains for me to thank once again Liz and Julian and Secretary of State for their presentations this morning, and can we thank them in the normal way? Thank you very much.